Hi folks, Matt Easton here. So in the last week I would say, the internet, by the internet I mean the HEMA sites mostly on Facebook that I frequent, seem to have gone kind of like crazy talking about cutting. Uh, there's um, articles about cutting, people debating about how you must cut, uh, usually with long swords they're talking about, but there is to some extent also talking about montantes, that is big two end swords. Um, the, obviously the debate that um, Roland and I and Thran have been having about Viking era hilts as well in regard to cutting and basically there's lots of kind of um, lots of sort of ranting I suppose about about how you must cut and uh, I guess the point of this video is to say there isn't only one way to cut if there's one thing that I've tried to accentuate over the last couple of years in my videos it is that there is a wide diversity is a wide variety in the ways that you cut and that you would want to cut in different contexts my favorite word there and also with different weapons just starting out you know looking at the the weapon uh, question as i have mentioned hundreds of times probably by now Indian swords in particular enforce a certain style of drawing cut and we also know that with this was used in Turkey and uh, Persia and certain other areas of, of the Middle East, North Africa and Asia um, and this is a completely uh, distinctive style of cutting that we find in certain places associated with certain swords Okay, and we know that it was done from the descriptor sources, we know that it was done both in a pushing motion and in a, in a drawing motion, okay? Quite circular kind of movements. Completely contrasting to that, we have the 18th and 19th century backsword and sabre style of cutting, which is very snappy, okay? So much so that we obviously get in the sabre school, we get this thumb up the back um, kind of tradition to facilitate this very quick snap cut and it, it's a completely different way of cutting to how you cut with a tool. Well, so how do you say, you know, if we just deal with just those two swords and just those two, two traditions for a minute, how can anybody possibly say that one is right and one is wrong? There is no right and wrong. There's just simply one style and one tradition and culture used a certain type of sword one way and a different culture used a different type of sword a different way, okay? They both produce wounds of differing types um, that have different strengths and weaknesses. As I've talked about before, the, the strength of the snap cut is not in its huge power, but it's very quick. Uh, it's very quick to redirect to other places, and it's got a lot of reach. Um, what the um, draw cut has is it creates very long sweeping wounds on the target and is famed for its cutting power uh, and wounding power, but what it doesn't have is range, is reach. However, if, and here's a strange combination you won't see very often, a Viking shield with a tool one, but if we're using a shield and a sword, then actually the shield enables you to come in close, by which point pushing and drawing cutting becomes much more practical. The sabre, used with the snap cut, is not used with a buckler or a shield, so you need all the distance you can get. So there's, it's all about context again. There is no right and wrong way to cut universally, there's only good ways to cut or effective ways to cut in a given context, in a given scenario with, you know, with certain, with shields involved or with not shields involved or whether there's certain types of armour, maybe padded armour or maybe none, no armour at all. Um, and this flows through to other swords as well. Um, if we go to the, um, the Viking hilt, for example, the Viking era type hilt, um, Again, we get into this debate of what is right and what is wrong. There is no right and wrong. First of all, we don't know, actually. We don't know how they were cutting. But if, for example, and I'm not saying they did, but if, for example, actually they were like uh, 19th century Indian swordsmen and they were predominantly draw cutting, there's no real evidence for this, but if they were predominantly draw cutting, then all of our assumptions about how they hold the sword and how they move the sword, and if we get the shields in here as well, actually becomes like Indian swordsmanship, okay, and it completely changes how we move the sword and how we hold the sword. However, if we think that they were a little bit more similar to uh, European sabre and back sword stuff, and that they're casting the point out and hitting like this, like you see in I-33 sword and buckler, for example, or indeed in Bolognese side sword or 19th century sabre, then again, it dictates how we hold the sword and how we move the sword. 
But we don't know in that scenario. We actually don't know whether, whether they were predominantly draw cutting or predominantly snap cutting or whether they were predominantly um, casting with the whole uh, elbow and arm or whether they were doing more from the wrist. You know, we just don't know. Um, so being absolute about rights and wrongs is sort of really, really silly. I'm being polite in saying that, but it's very, very silly. In that case, because we don't really know very much about how they were moving the sword and using it in conjunction with the shield. We've only got descriptive accounts in sagas um, and um, so, you know some kind of um, descriptive accounts in Anglo-Saxon poetry and things like this. We have really scant evidence to go on and the artwork and we all know the problems with interpreting from artwork alone. Um, we do, the only other bit of evidence we have actually is archaeological wounds. We do have some wound evidence, but again, you can't, if you can see, for example, a cut through someone's skull, all you can really tell, usually, is that a blade passed through that person's skull. You can't tell what kind of cut it was. Sometimes you can't tell which direction it came from because you don't know what angle their skull was at when they were hit. And equally, if it's, um, you know, if it's going through their head from uh, above to below, you can often tell that it was from above to below, but that's assuming they're standing up. If they were lying down, it might have come from a different angle, or if they were in the process of falling over, or if they were being wrestled by someone else, or this kind of thing. But equally, they could have been hit from behind or in front very often, you can't tell that kind of thing. Or they could have been hit from the side, you know. Um, they might have had their head turned, or they might have had their head and body straight. We don't know those kind of details. Um, and this comes over into longsword. I'll grab the two-hander because I have that to hand rather than the longsword. People write a lot about cutting, and the longsword and the, the greatsword, in fact, we know a lot more about how to use them from the treatises. There's a lot more detail. But you know what? We also know for a fact, whether you look at Morozzo or whether you look at... Um, uh, you know, any of the Lichtenau sources, or you look at Fiore and Vardy, um, or you look at the later greatsword stuff like uh, Alfieri Spadone, um, or the um, Spanish Mon Montante stuff. If you look at any of those things, you can see, actually, there isn't one way of cutting. There are actually a variety of ways of cutting. We can see something like a Scheifelhau is given like a snap cut, lifting the hands up very high. But we can equally see cuts that are given with the hands low and a bit of bend in the elbows, more, more a traditional kind of slicing chop. Um, equally, we can see things like schnitt, which are given with contact first and then a drawing cut or a, or a push cut in, if you look at Codex Wallerstein, for example, you can see where the blade is laid on and then slid forwards on the person's arms. Uh, we know that there are, of course, cuts with the back edge that come like a chop. We know that there are cuts with the back edge that come like a slice. So, <laughs> essentially, if we look at the really documented fighting styles that we know about in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries, for two-handed swords, for example, um, you can see chops, push cuts, draw cuts with both edges from any angle. You can see false edge cuts from above. You can see true edge cuts from below. You can see, see everything you can think of. So, <laughs> making absolute comments about, you know, black and white comments about good cutting and bad cutting, a lot of the time I read it and I think, what, like, why are you guys just focusing on one type of cut and ignoring everything else? The fact is, it's actually about wounding an opponent. Um, and in different contexts, different types of cut with different types of sword are going to be more or less preferable. And that's really all we can say. Um, so there we go, guys. That's the end of my rant. And it's really just to say, stop talking about cutting like there's an absolute right and wrong. The fact is, there are hundreds of ways to cut someone. Um, or at least, if not, if not hundreds, there are dozens of ways to cut someone effectively. And different of those types of cut will have benefits um, or drawbacks in any given scenario. And you have to <laughs> use them on that balance. Cheers, guys. Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.